And now, our last speaker, Julio Santos from Life on Mars and Fractal. Hello. Oh, great. Um, I have these slides. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Julio, like your host here uh, told you all. Um, I'd like to uh, start by clarifying what this talk is not going to be about. I am not going to be mindlessly droning on about how some new shitcoin is going to disrupt disruption. I am not going to be giving anyone investment advice, obviously. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is to, to talk to you to explain why I believe that blockchain technology is something that is worth your time and attention and explain why I'm going to devote myself to it for the years to come. I'm going to talk about decentralization, why that's a good thing, why blockchain tech can be used to take us down that road. I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum in the context of crypto economics and what that is. Um, I'm going to use digital scarcity and digital art as examples for use cases of the technology. And I'm going to wrap up by um, with a note on ICOs and why they're a super exciting new way of financing the future, which was the agenda. Um, right, uh, decentralization. When, when people talk about this, they, they often come from a cypherpunk or a libertarian perspective. They talk about censorship resistance. They talk about resistance to government control. Um, it's simply beautiful that I can transfer value to anybody in the world using the Bitcoin network or that I can publish anything on the Ethereum network and there's nothing any of you can do to stop me. There's nothing anybody can do to stop me. And this perspective is not wrong and it's, it's very dear to my heart, but it's incomplete. It, it misses a larger point. Um, first of all, centralized services are inherently more insecure. Uh, they grow into hacker honeypots. Uh, a good analogy for blockchain security is that it's much easier to rob a bank than it is to rob every single customer of that bank. And uh, we have to look no further than the recent Equifax hack, where, well, more than 100 million people are now exposed to identity theft and uh, credit card fraud. But uh, secondly, and, and much more importantly in my perspective, the incentives of a centralized platform tend to benefit the platform's owner as it grows in size and scope a lot more and at the expense of other network stakeholders. So when, when networks start out, they do their best to attract not only users, but also third-party ecosystem participants like application developers. And they do that because the more users a network has, the more valuable it becomes. Same thing for its ecosystem. Uh, a platform, a network with a vibrant ecosystem is one that can attract users a lot better. So as platforms grow in adoption, so does their power over the very users that enable this growth in the first place. And predictably, this power asymmetry eventually turns attraction into extraction and cooperation into uh, competition, which this uh, chart by Andreessen Horowitz captures really, really well. And I'll illustrate this with an example that I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is Twitter. When it started out, it offered a great service for free. It encouraged third-party developers to build on top of its network and create third-party applications. And uh, these applications were in large part responsible for driving adoption and uh, popularizing the service. However, as uh, Twitter grew in users and power, um, things started to change. Twitter started to extract value from the users by placing a cost on the service through advertising. Twitter started phasing out third-party applications because it started regarding them as competitors for eyeballs instead of ecosystem partners. And this is a very predictable partner, uh, sorry, a very predictable pattern for centralized networks. And we've seen this with Facebook, we've seen this with Google, we've seen this with a lot of others. And developers are getting wary. We don't want to build on top of this stuff anymore because we know what is going to happen. It is a gigantic existential risk for a company to build on top of an aggregator. Users as well, they don't fare too well normally. They also tend to get the short end of the stick. 
they are vulnerable to arbitrary decisions by a central authority. What behaviors, what content, what is allowed on the platform? Who's in and who's out? Who gets banned? What features get developed? Users often have no voice in any of this, and sure, they can vote with their feet, but often, because of aggregation effects and because of moats, they have nowhere else to turn to, to have nowhere else to go. Now, I think that blockchain technology kind of holds the key to push back against centralization. I think that we can take back the internet from the incumbent juggernauts. We can make this a much fairer place for everybody to have a chance at participating. And we can do this because blockchain technology introduces a super powerful new feature into networks, which is trust. Trust between users, developers, and other network stakeholders. And this trust emerges, first of all, from the way that the blockchain is cryptographically secured. But much more interestingly, it emerges from the fact that we can use game theory and mechanism design to build token economies, crypto economies, on top of this trust layer so that the end result is we can trust the network without having to trust any of its individual participants. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin as an example of what a crypto economy is. Um, so blockchain as a data structure is kind of really old. Actually, it's almost 30 years old. And about a decade ago, this entity called Satoshi decided to leverage that data structure to create a proof of concept for a decentralized currency. So this would be a currency whose issuance is controlled by none other by than a piece of software that is open source and peer-to-peer -peer and whose rules are priorly known to all the participants. Now, I'll explain a little bit how this works. Uh, so so in, a normal, in a normal bank, say that Alice and Bob have an account at the same bank, their, their number is, their, their balance, their money is a number on a database. I mean, because of fractional reserve banking, the bank doesn't really keep the money at hand. So if Alice wants to send 100 euro to Bob, the bank effectively goes into the database, subtracts 100 from Alice's number, adds 100 to Bob's. And this tends to work. Alice and Bob trust the bank to do this properly. They usually do. They also have no choice. But Bitcoin sees things differently. I'm going to oversimplify this a little bit. What I'm saying is not exactly technically, technically true, but I think it carries across the point. I'm happy to explain this in more detail if you guys want it later. Um, the way Bitcoin sees this is instead of having a centralized database where these balances are kept, instead of that, let's distribute the database to thousands and thousands of nodes. And the actual balances will be represented by a canonical instance of that database, which is the result of the consensus in between all of these different databases. That way there's no single point of failure. Again, it's a lot harder to hack 10,000 computers than a super secure single one. There's no central point of failure for this. And this, the idea is, so the cool thing about Bitcoin is not, oh, we've got decentralized money. <laughs> the cool thing about Bitcoin is not even using a blockchain. The cool thing about Bitcoin is the insight that if they combine this kind of append-only cryptographic data structure, which is never append-only because you can change the bits and the bytes in your own machine, but you can't if there's a thousand of these. So Bitcoin's insight of how to get thousands of participants to work for the network out of their own self-interest and thereby having a network emerge that is secure and that can maintain balances in a way that everybody can trust, that's what's interesting about it. That's why this is cool, because Bitcoin invented a way to make sure that you would run a Bitcoin node, and people are. Like, the way that this works is that, again, oversimplifying, but if you run a Bitcoin node, you're essentially participating in a lottery in which you can be attributed newly minted Bitcoin to yourself. And driven by the self-interest, folks do run nodes, a lot of folks. And this incentive worked. We've got tens of thousands of Bitcoin nodes today, and every single new node incrementally adds to the security of the network because it becomes that much more difficult to orchestrate a coordinated attack against a sufficient number of nodes to take it down. Now I'm using this as an example because, well, first of all, everybody knows it. Uh, and second of all, it's a super simple example of crypto economics or in other words, how do you get people to do stuff using blockchain technology? Um, I don't really buy into it too much. Uh, I don't think it's uh, that much of a great thing. Currencies tend to be really complicated. 
like the euro and the dollar have a lot of highly paid, very smart people kind of trying to figure out how to manage that based on economic conditions, and I'm not really sure this is going to solve that. Um, but somehow it worked. Somehow it's above 100 billion in total value today, which is a good amount of billion. And uh, a lot of people seem to believe in it. I think there's much more interesting things that we can do with blockchain tech. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Ethereum. Because a couple of years after Bitcoin came out, there was this guy, Vitalik, and Vitalik was part of the Bitcoin team. And uh, he kind of has been, have been try has been trying to convince everybody that Bitcoin needed to be upgraded to support more use cases. Because it didn't do much. People didn't listen to him, so he decided to launch his own network. It's called Ethereum. And then like Bitcoin, which is essentially a machine for value transfer, can't do much more than that. Ethereum was to be a world computer. So it's a public utility network. It's a platform for arbitrary computation and storage, on top of which decentralized applications could be built. And the core building block of these applications is what we now call smart contracts. Now, because Ethereum is a, well, this world computer thing with arbitrary computation and storage, participating in this network was going to get expensive. Because every node that is in the network is responsible for validating the transactions, for participating in the consensus process, for making sure that the network's content stays legit. So this was going to get expensive, and Ethereum kind of introduced this concept of gas, which is a network fee. The way that it works is that every time you want the network to work for you, you want to make a value transfer, you want to execute a method on a smart contract, you want to store information, you will pay a fee that is proportional to the volume of your computation and your storage. This fee is paid in Ether, which is a native crypto token of the Ethereum network. And Ether is to Ethereum what Bitcoin is to Bitcoin, which doesn't help much, but it is the currency that operates the network. It's, it's more accurately called a utility token because you use it to pay for network utility. And what this is for, well, this makes sure that the code that you run is elegant and efficient. This makes sure that you don't do redundant storage. This makes sure that you don't overtax the network. And it also helps prevent denial of service attacks. And the way that this ether is generated it's done in a very similar way as Bitcoin. If you participate in the network, help validate transactions, help participate in the consensus project process for the emergence of this canonical state instance, then you can be rewarded with Ether as well. So these are two very simple examples of the same thing, of the idea that you lend your computing power and you lend your honesty to the network and the network rewards you for doing exactly that and it punishes you if you try to do something that kind of falls outside of that. And this is what is meant by crypto economics. It is, this is a quote from Vitalik. Um, it's the use of economic incentives to reward participants that further the goals of the network and to punish participants that, well, hurt the goals of the network. Um, and Ethereum has been a lot more used than Bitcoin in a number of metrics. It's, uh, it's responsible for the whole explosion of different solutions around blockchain technology because people can easily build on top of it. So folks are playing with insurance contracts. They're playing with supply chain tracking and tracing and financing. They're playing with self-sovereign identities. And these basic crypto economics that we see in Bitcoin and Ethereum have been extended into much higher levels of complexity. So people are building things like prediction markets, which help us see the future while maintaining the right incentives so that each participant contributes information that is honest as to their best knowledge. People are, there's a great new crypto economic primitive called the token curated registry, which is a beautiful game designed mechanism to guarantee the accurate curation of lists, which can be used for things like access control. People are playing with this for all sorts of stuff and I think it's really, really exciting. And I'm going to give you an example um, in, in the context of art that I think is really easy to understand. Um, so the reason that, or one of the reasons that cryptocurrencies work, one of the reasons that these token economies work is that there is scarcity in them. I mean, it's obviously implied when we talk about Bitcoin 
that Bitcoin is scarce. Because if Bitcoin weren't scarce, its value would tend to zero. If there's infinite of something, and if something is infinitely accessible, then nobody's going to pay anything for it because they can just get it. But I just wanted to make that explicit. And, and somewhere else where we see um, the concept of scarcity being very valuable is in art, traditionally. I mean, why, why would I buy an original Picasso? It doesn't look better than a reproduction. It might even look worse. It doesn't necessarily look better than a poster unless it's up close. I, I buy an original Picasso because then I can say I have an original Picasso. And nobody else does because there's only one of these and it's mine. And bragging rights have long been a reliable economic driver. So this scarcity has so far only been available as an economic mechanism for offline analog art. Because physical items aren't really easily copyable. But in the digital world, where information wants to be free, and it should be free, this never really made much sense. Like, we've been trying to fight piracy for years. It's a, it's a lost battle. It's, it's a wrong battle. Because we shouldn't be putting up any barriers to consumption. We should reward creation. We should reward curation. But that's about it. We need to find different ways to guarantee that everybody has access to everything while at the same time compensating the ones that create the content that they consume. And the way that this is done today is through platforms like Patreon, for example. As a digital artist, I might have an Instagram following and I'll tell them, hey guys, this is my new collection. Please go into Patreon. Please, you know, sponsor me. I'm gonna, so I can keep doing great work. And, and this is awesome. Like, I'm, I use Patreon every month. I'm a monthly contributor. It's a great place where content creators and content appreciators get together and they try to keep the whole content wheel going. But this is incomplete. We can do a lot better than this. This is charity. We can bring scarcity into the digital world, world with blockchain tech because we can sell the ownership of an original piece of digital art as a permanent record, for example, on the Ethereum blockchain that nobody can ever take away. And sure, everybody's going to be able to see your GIF, but you have a proof that you own the original or that you funded the original. That's you, just like with the original Picasso, but for millennials, essentially. And this isn't, this isn't really like me making stuff up. I mean, this, this exists. There's a platform called the Zello. This platform guarantees that every time that an artist creates and registers a piece of art, every time that it gets sold from that point on, the artist will always get a commission on the revenue. This guarantees that you as the owner of a piece of digital art can claim it as yours, regardless of who has a copy of it. I think this is fascinating for the future of art. Something else that I'd like to talk about, and I'll wrap up, I know we want to go watch the game, um, is ICOs. And ICOs, I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. It's a pun <laughs> on IPO. Uh, initial Public Offering. It, that's what happens when a company kind of goes to the stock market for the first time and uh, sells shares of their stock. Um, the difference here is that instead of, instead of shares being sold or shares in a company being sold, you're selling shares in a network. So take Ethereum, for example. In order to finance the building of the network, Ethereum launched the first popular ICO, where they raised a few million in Bitcoin. So they sold some Ether tokens for their network that they had generated for Bitcoin and converted that Bitcoin into cash to fund their operations. And this makes perfect sense for them. I mean, it's, you know, people like money, that's great. Having money to build stuff is great. We might be asking, why would anybody participate in these things? Well, it's pretty much the same reason that somebody buys a share, a share of a company's stock. Um, so a share is a metaphorical slice of a metaphorical pie, and as a company's value appreciates, then the pie grows and presumably your size will as well. And the similar train of thought is present here in ICOs, but the mechanics by which people expect appreciation of value to occur are slightly different. So, for example, in Ethereum, the, the expectation is that as more people, as the network becomes more useful, provides more services, serves more use cases, more people want to come into the network. You'll recall from before that usage of the network needs to be paid for in Ether. So people wanting to come into the network need to buy Ether to interact with it. Because Ether is scarce, 
the law of supply and demand applies. And more people wanting to buy will create an upward pressure on the price of the token. When these people join the network, they will provide services, they will consume services, they will participate, increasing the value of the network and the whole cycle starts again. And this is the principle behind a basic understanding of what, how a token economy should look like. Now, unfortunately, um, the ICO space has been rife with scams and bullshit and it's really not a great place to be sometimes. It's a little bit like with every technology that shows up, except there's a lot more money here. So there's obviously a lot more scamming going on. Um, and even when, even when folks um, think they're being honest about things and even when there's no malicious intent, people often, you know, this is done on the internet. They say it's an unregulated space. Who cares? Let's just see what happens. This is extremely irresponsible. Every time that you're selling something, you have to abide by consumer protection laws. If you're selling something that is remotely resembling of a financial instrument, you've got to abide by capital markets laws. People ignore this completely. And now, time for a little shameless plug. This is exactly the space that I'm in. So my company, Fractal Blockchain, is in regulatory compliance. We help companies conduct their ICOs in a globally compliant manner. That's what we've been doing for a few months now. And, um, well, Talk to me if you're looking to do one. Talk to me if you're a great developer that's looking to get into crypto. This is uh, my email. I really hope that I managed to convey a decent idea of why I think that this is relevant. And I really encourage you all to see past the hype and try and understand why this is going to be interesting. Because when smartphones came out, folks were all like, but those screens are tiny. And that processing power is ridiculous. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between portability and then, in, well, in the initial case, is localization. And, well, what you had before in terms of processing power and screen size. And because that's something that works, folks get together to finance it, to evolve it, and to turn the trade-off into something that is worth it. And I believe that's what, that's what we're undergoing now. Thank you. Really, no questions about something like this. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. So, um, I fully agree with uh, you, what you said about the potentials of blockchain technology. But one thing that kind of worries me is the cost of everything when you scale it up. Uh, we've seen like a billion new networks coming out that use uh, mainly proof of work to validate transactions. And I think uh, most of us have heard the news about how many energy the Bitcoin network is consuming. And yeah, sure, we, ha we have uh, some networks that are moving to proof of stake, but that has its own set of issues. Uh, personally, I'm interested in stuff like the Tangle and Stellar network that use uh, DAGs and that kind of stuff, but I'm Those wondering. aren't decentralized. Yeah, I know, but uh, that's, I'm kind of wanting to know what you think about that whole aspect. Of course. Of so, first of all, the technology is in its early stages, as you said very well. Uh, so, the, the, the question, I, I'm not sure it was clear, but it's something along the lines of, what do you think of the tremendous consumption of resources and the focus on proof of work as a consensus method for blockchain? Something along those lines, yeah. And um, first of all, the technology in its early stages, proof of work was the consensus method that Bitcoin chose uh, for their network. It's a pretty dumb one. I mean, I mean, it's super elegant from an engineering perspective, but it's something that doesn't really work out when you have such competition for all the resources of the network. Trying to be a miner now is really, really difficult and there's a lot of energy being spent there. And because of that, well, first of all, there's been alternative methods developed like proof of stake in which instead of, uh, gonna be hand wavy here, but instead of competing for your Bitcoin prize with uh, say processing power, you compete for it with existing wealth. And the idea that your chances of winning this lottery are proportional to your existing wealth in the network makes sense from a game theoretical point of view because you would not want to screw with a network where most of your wealth lies. So 
Proof of stake is just one example. There's plenty of others uh, around, and I'm really excited about the evolution of that space. I don't think, I don't really see that as a concern for two reasons. First of all, because I believe that the technology will evolve to service, and there's plenty of early signs of that happening, and there's plenty of blockchains in production that use different consensus methods. And second of all, because even if there was no alternative, if we're doing this, is because there's utility for mankind. And there's plenty of ways to generate energy. We just happen to hate nuclear for some stupid reason, for example. But um, if that's something that would make sense, it's a price to pay. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. We have time for one more question. And then sports ball. Yes. Okay, they are really World Cup fans. <laughs> they just want to make sure that they are free in a couple of minutes. Okay, in that case, conclusion. Thank you. Thank you.